So let's get back to that. Sorry about that. They're getting the labs ready for the fall semester here and they're running around putting thermometers in everywhere. Okay, so speaking of which coronavirus, right? Um, so here you can actually see that bacteriophage here. Now viruses and their imaging, this all comes down to our ability to use electron microscopes. So you can actually see which types of viruses could actually be collected. And once you started looking, you found them everywhere. Okay, and here's that bacteriophage sitting on top of a prokaryotic cell. There's a bacterial cell there, and this is the size of a eukaryotic cell. And you can begin to see the scale of the size of the virus, viruses. And this is a fairly large one right here. The evolution, we do, did they devolve from living cells? Did they escape from cells? Are they self-replicating mo molecules? And the real answer is for, you know, the years and the years and the years that people have been studying them. And I would say that's probably happened since right about the late 1860s or so, right? Um, nobody's sure. And, and that's, you know, and when you think about the complexity of uh, ever living organisms and their structures, chances are these were around long before we had unicellular structures, but you can't go back, you know, 500 million years and figure out where these happened from. Although you just made me think about somebody who's working on something that's 600 million years old. So maybe we could go back and ask them, oh, Jonathan, write down that idea. Okay, hold on a second here. Pause, pause, pause. Nope, you're still recording. Hold on a second. Pause, yeah. We'll, we'll make sure you write it down later. That's a good experiment. Okay, so virus morphology. Here's that T4. It has actually a head. It has the DNA inside of it. Okay, it might be RNA. It could be double-stranded or single-stranded. It could have a protein capsid surrounding it. And what I want you to make sure you understand is this is supposed to be analogous to an envelope or a cell membrane that looks like it's an envelope. But inside each of these examples, bacteriophage, adenovirus, HIV, retrovirus, you have something that's protecting the genetic material so that when it finds what it's supposed to find to infect, it knows now to transport that material into that living organism. There are four basic shapes, filamentous tobacco mosaic virus here, that icosahedral enveloped and head and tail, where you have this T4 again, you actually have the head here, the tail here. And then of course, this is drawing these sort of weird spider-like legs for you to see that what it's doing is it's finding a way to inject now the genetic information in. Should remind you a lot of say, I don't know, maybe a mosquito. Um, it actually has a, the bac bacteria T4 actually has a DNA genome. Obviously, it's been studied. Remember, we did a lab. No, we did an examination of the uh, incorporation of P32 into the DNA here to show that genetic information is what is exchanged, number one. But number two, we're thinking about how we cut that up and what Mother Nature would actually have to do to it to get it to become inhibited. This is where we actually have all of our understanding of, say, CRISPR mechanisms inside of bacterial cells. And that is their internal mechanism to protect them from viral DNA or exogenous DNA for that matter. Adenovirus, these infect the human respiratory tract. It's not enveloped, okay? And other non-enveloped viruses include poliovirus, human papillomavirus, and the hepatitis A type vi virus. Now we don't expect you to go out and figure out what each of these are doing, but if you wanna spend some time being completely fascinated by how Mother Nature can literally turn you into a meal without even thinking about it, you should go take a look at some of these. HIV retrovirus is a great example of attacking a specific portion of a living organism and the tissue inside of it targets specifically um, T4 cells inside your immune system. And by removing T4 cells inside your immune system, what it does is it literally removes your immune system, meaning your adaptive immune system and meaning all of the potential things that could try to kill you, leaving you with primarily just your innate immune system, which isn't sufficient to keep you alive. So it's fairly effective at what it's doing. It doesn't necessarily help it too much if you die, which means once it becomes infection, infectious inside of you, it must pass on to the next organism. So viruses do have gen genomes. They're fascinating to study. Um, they could be DNA or RNA, but they're never both. Okay, the genome is much smaller than our cell's genome. And the DNA directs the host cell to make new virus copies. It gets in, co-ops the system, and then 
will create a system where that one cell makes all, everything that happens afterwards. If we were inside of a classroom, I'd explain to you how your cells respond to this, but anytime you've ever felt nauseous when you've gotten a cold, anytime a cell becomes infected, it sends a signal out to the adjacent cells using interferons to say, look, I'm infected. I think it's a viral infection. Protect your cells, shut down your normal G1, S, G2 processes, okay? And they do. And if they don't, they become infected. And this is Mother Nature's way of sort of corralling in the viral infection. And what we can do, once you actually start studying them, you can see that you can classify them based on specific phenotypic characteristics, right? Look at that. Core classifications are for, is it a DNA or RNA type virus? Is it single-stranded or is it double-stranded? Is it a linear virus or is it a, signal, a single, circular virus? Each of these are different examples of those that can be found. Some of the more interesting ones that are found inside of here, right? You know, smallpox, um, we think about papillomaviruses. The ones that are, of course, missing here that are really cool are like Ebola and hatnaviruses that create specific states of um, acute loss of life as a result of their infectious cycle. Okay, and that's really, you know, I think I, sent, I gave you guys that, uh, the, the um, I made you guys watch that one movie from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute where people were looking at what it means to work inside environments in the mid 2000s where Ebola virus would strike, strike rapidly, strike violently. And then notice how quickly, once you figure out its route of passage, you could actually begin to corral how it behaves. It's kind of funny when you think about that. Now, David Baltimore came up with this Baltimore classification. Um, you know, the idea, of course, is once you start looking, you can see that there are different sub ways to think about um, groupings of DNA. Again, this would be sort of analogous to Linnaeus, sort of characterizing first based on morphology, and then ultimately at the end of the day, when we finally get the ability to sequence those genomes, they're going to be rearranged. And that's exactly what happened here as well. So here's a link to go, you guys to go see how a virus invades your body. It's actually kind of informative when you're thinking about why it is maybe um, the viruses have been as effective as they have over the course of millions and millions and millions of years. Now, obviously there's gonna be cytopathic effects. Lysis will cause cells to rupture open. They, apoptosis will occur when the cell is like, I'm getting infected, therefore I'm going to kill myself. And these are, the widespread symptoms that are due to body's immune responses. This is, you know, that interferon effect I was telling you about a moment ago. Um, we don't really develop it inside this class, but it's important that you understand your body knows when it's sick. So it can literally stop the infection within your body. It doesn't do it for other organisms around it. It's so you can survive whatever the infection is. So how does a virus actually get in? There are four basic steps, attach, entry, replication, and assembly of all the viral infectious materials, and then egress. How does it actually get out? And these days, you know, thinking all the way back to March, people are like, no, wear a mask, no, don't wear a mask. Any idiot that said you shouldn't wear a mask should actually be forced to become infected by something. Viruses will find any way they can to get into and out of your body. And Obviously, COVID-19 is no different. So attachment would be receptors on the surface of a cell, usually binding for, through a virus envelope glycoprotein, and then therefore the virus can be very specific about what type of cell it will infect. Entry, DNA can actually enter into the cell like this bacteria, I mean bacteriophage T4 here, or the entire structure can come in, okay? through, in this case, receptor-mediated endocytosis. And what's going to happen for a virus genome, of DNA, RNA, RNA retrovirus, these are the different steps. I'm not asking you to memorize them. I'm asking you to think about what's actually going on. DNA makes mRNA. That sounds familiar. RNA will make a complementary RNA structure if it's required, okay? And then it will make new RNA genomes to be sent out. RNA retrovirus actually takes RNA reverse transcribes it to make DNA, and then DNA incorporates into the host genome. Now think about how insidious that is and what that would actually do if it inserts someplace other than 
where it would be useful. Now, if we think about some of the more potent RNA retroviruses, chances are the virus is trying to kill you and it doesn't matter where it's inserting into. How does it actually get out? Cell death, there are usually two types. There's lytic and lysogenic types of um, you know, uh, viral egress. Lytic is the entire cell destroys, killing the, the host cell and releasing the infectious materials outward. Or budding, which would be the lysogenic, slow sort of release of prolonged, protracted release of materials. And in doing so, um, increases the likelihood that the virus will stay around for a period of time. If I'm a betting person, this is what we're going to see with COVID-19. Okay, these are different cartoons for how, say in this case, uh, adenovirus or influenza can actually get in, create problems for you, and then slowly begin to release materials outward. Notice RNA and proteins are made and assembled into those new virons, and that's what actually now, because it's picked up part of the coat protein of the human, can travel through the body with a little bit more ease than it did when it first got into the body. This is the lytic cycle for um, the bacteria T4, where you actually have a lytic cycle here that causes the uh, death of the cell, and then it will go into a lysogenic cycle, which will then actually create another set of steps. So it can switch between these depending upon what it's doing inside of an organism. And that's that mechanism of quorum sensing I had you guys look up at the beginning of this semester. Now animal viruses themselves, we'll, we'll stop pretty soon. Animal viruses themselves may cause acute disease. They can have chronic infections like with, through say hepatitis C, which can cause oncogenesis down here. You could also have asymptomatic infections like human herpes viruses, right? On the whole, they infect your nervous system. They tend to stay out of the way until you're stressed, but they're highly infectious. And, you know, they're a marker for many different things, but where they actually infect is kind of important. Um, I'm going to give you one example here if we think about uh, varicella, varicella zoster or chicken pox. Usually it's something that happens inside of your, kid, your, your childhood. You'll have a viral latent, latency, but it, because it infects your nervous system, it can also create these things that are called shingles later inside your life, right? And the DNA genome becomes incorporated into the host DNA, which then can become reactivated after a period of time inside of your body. This is your immune system trying to get rid of those cells that have the DNA genome inside of it. Now, Mother Nature is trying to do a good thing here, but it's incredibly painful for those individuals who actually have shingles. Human papillomavirus, this is one for um, general humans. Um, papillomavirus itself, um, which can lead and does lead to cervical cancer as well as different forms of cancers in both males and females, to naked icosahedral capsid. Um, and what's going to happen is it's double-stranded DNA genome is incorporated into the host gene genome. It's sexually transmitted and is oncogenic. Um, where Jack Rose and, uh, oh God, I can't think of her name. They demonstrated the oncogenicity of this inside of rabbits, where you would actually take specific dosages, place it on the rabbit membrane, and then rabbit skin membrane, and then actually demonstrate that it would become um, oncogenic. Not necessarily really caring about plant viruses so much, except that you actually have horizontal transmission and vertical transmission where virus is transmitted from say the parent plant or can come from some other vector, okay? That such to say an insect bite eating a leaf or something like, like that. The idea of course is finishing all of this up is that um, viruses on the whole create a bit of random genetic information that's introduced into a cell and can then drive how it is evolution occurs inside of those organisms. Now, it's definitely really difficult to model because we don't know the how, the where, the when, and the why, but it's something I want you to be thinking about as we finish off this semester. I think I might have one more lecture in me here someplace, but I think thinking about your final, thinking about getting you guys ready for the final for the upcoming end of the week. I think this might be the last piece of new information, but let me go take a look at the final exam that I put together and make sure that whatever is covered, you guys are prepared for. Okay, so it's been interesting working with you, um, and uh, I'm gonna put this stuff up on Blackboard for you right now. Okay, be safe, bye.